नेक्स्ट प्रेजेंटेशन इज ऑन मैनेजमेंट ऑफ डिस्ट्रप्टिड पेनक्रेटिक को डक्ट सिंड्रोम स्पीकर इज डॉक्टर श्रीहरि अनिकंदी प्लीज वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू दिस ऑगस्ट ऑडियंस आई वुड बी डिस्कसिंग ऑन द मैनेजमेंट ऑफ डिस्कनेक्टेड पेनक्रेटिक डक्ट सिंड्रोम Uh, in the next 10 minutes or so and uh, disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome is an extremely common problem uh, that is present but i think there is a general lack of awareness or we don't seek for a disconnected pancreatic duct when we are dealing with uh, patients with acute pancreatitis and we have to be aware of how to manage a disconnected pancreatic duct so what is disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome it is basically the necrosis of the main pancreatic duct leading to disconnection between the viable upstream pancreatic parenchyma and duodenum so you need three essential things to call it as a dpds one there is a necrosis of more than 2 cm of the pancreatic parenchyma because anything less than li- that is likely to lead to a stricture but not a complete disruption second there has to be a viable pancreatic tissue which is upstream and which is a- able to drain the pancreatic secretions into this disrupted duct and third you should be able to demonstrate though this is not essential but if you are able to demonstrate a free extravasation of contrast through this disrupted duct that is the sign q non so how does a patient present a patient with disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome usually presents with some of these sequelae and that is when you realize that this patient has a dpds because usually you don't seek out for this in the beginning you either the patient either presents with a refractory uh, fluid collection or an external pancreatic fistula if a drain has been placed or internal fistula like ascites or effusions or there is an history of recurrent pancreatitis so these are the situations where you suspect that this patient probably has a disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome so how do you diagnose so in the initial stages of the disease uh, it is very difficult to pick up because the radiological changes take time to appear and usually around the second week or later on the radiological changes appear you will see a necrotic area the, the investigations of choice are a ct abdomen or a secretin mrcp you would see a necrotic area of at least 2 cm there is a viable pancreatic tissue upstream so how do you say it is viable because it is enhancing on an intravenous contrast and you are likely to see a dilated main pancreatic duct upstream this might be dilated or non dilated one important feature is that in a pancre- in a uh, disconnected pancreatic duct the main pancreatic duct usually enters the pancreatic fluid collection at 90 degrees in non uh, disrupted duct there is a chance that the collection is uh, compressing here the mpd would be at an oblique angle ercp is considered the gold standard uh, on an ercp of, you will be finding an obstructed mpd at the site of a pancreatic fluid collection or, or you will have an contrast extra- extravasation without any upstream filling of the uh, pancreatic duct the most common sites for a pancreatic ductal disruption of the pancreatic neck because this is the area which is prone to ischemia because of the blood flow however ercp mind you is not recommended for just a diagnostic purpose in today's era it is more for a therapeutic purpose because you can introduce infections into a sterile pancreatic bed and there is a chance of inducing pancreatitis so as with all cases management of dpds uh, relies on conservative methods surgery or endotherapy now for dpds a conservative management is unlikely to result in complete resolution antibiotics and nutritional therapy though are important in all cases enteral is always better than parenteral nutrition and there is no proven role of a somatostatin analog when there is a draining fistula now the surgical options are either resection or internal drainage internal drainage you have options of a cystro gastrostomy a cysto jejunostomy pancreatico gastrostomy or a pancreatico jejunostomy or a fistulo jejunostomy the problems with resection are they often lead to endocrine or exocrine insufficiency because you are already dealing with a necrotic pancreatic tissue so internal drainage is the preferred choice when you are thinking of surgery 
But the problem with surgery is that it is often very challenging because there is a lot of ongoing inflammation. Uh, there are presence of collaterals in many of these cases because of splenic vein thrombosis. And there is especially a high recurrence rate when you do an internal drainage procedure which is surgical. So that brings us to endoscopic manage management of DPDS. So when we talk of endoscopic management of DPDS, the best choice of treatment depends on whether there is predominantly a pancreatic fluid collection that you are dealing with with a DPDS or there is a fistulizing disease which you are dealing with. Now if it's an associated pancreatic fluid collection, this makes things easier for us. Now to drain a pancreatic fluid collection, you usually have three options. One is a percutaneous drain, second is a transmural drainage which is endoscopic and the third is a transpapillary drainage through a conventional ERCP. Now a percutaneous drain which otherwise is used frequently when there is no DPDS in disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome percutaneous drainage has a high risk of formation of a external pancreatic fistula so this is not preferred when you have a DPDS you should not go for a percutaneous drain sometimes you might use this it might be indicated if you are dealing with a sick patient as a temporizing procedure but not as a procedure of choice. Transpapillary drainage is also not recommended because it is very unlikely that you, are, you will be able to completely bridge the disconnected pancreatic duct which is possible in only 9% of the patients. Moreover, you are likely to introduce infection in a sterile pancreatic bed and the very small caliber of stents are unlikely to drain the necrotic pancreas. So mind you, DPDS occurs in necrotizing pancreatitis in just interstitial pancreatitis, you are not likely to get a DPDS. So transpapillary drainage is out. So the best modality for a DPDS associated with fluid collection is a transmural drainage. So transmural drainage is either through plastic stents or now that the lumen opposing stents are available. If you go in for a plastic stent, what we are basically doing with a transmural drainage is we are creating a iatrogenic internal fistula. So when you use a plastic stent, it is recommended that it be kept indefinite or as long as possible because once you remove the plastic stents early, it has been seen that there is a recurrence of pancreatic fluid collection because of the DPDS and this is seen in a very high proportion of cases up to 38%. Long term stent placement, the risk of migration is not very high, 15% over 2 years with a very negligible adverse event rate. A single 10 French stent might be good enough, it works as well as a, a double 7 French plastic stent which is used in most of the centers. Now with the use of lamps, when we put in a lamps for a disconnected pancreatic duct with a, a pseudocyst uh, with a uh, worn, it has to be removed at 3 to 4 weeks because there is a high risk of bleeding or buried stent otherwise. It is generally recommended to replace the SEMS with a plastic stent after removal. But there are studies which have shown that after lamps removal, the risk of recurrence is also not very high. It is only 9% as opposed to the removal of plastic stent. That is because the stems are longer, are wider diameter and they do a complete drainage. One more additional advantage is you can do an endoscopic necrosectomy when you are using a lamps. There is also a hybrid drainage which might be required when you have large collections or of, extensions of collections with lot of solid debris. These work synergistically. We are using the transmural st uh, stent to prevent the EPF and the PCD allows you to irrigate and aspirate the cavity. Okay, so if there is a fistula formation and there is no PFC, now this makes things a bit more difficult. Here the options are either surgery or some complex endoscopic interventions. Few of the interventions I would like to highlight here, one is by creating an artificial pancreatic fluid collection where you clamp the PCD if it has been placed in a fistula. Uh, a PCD is there, you instill, three, uh, you clamp the PCD, see if there is any collection or you instill 100 to 300 ml of saline through the PCD and create an artificial PFC and then under endosono guidance, you put in a guide wire and then dilate the tract and place the stent. There is outside in transluminal puncture where a percutaneous tract through the PCD is cannulated and across that a tips needle is taken over and you go near the stomach or duodenum and then puncture it and then put in a guide wire into the lumen and this track is dilated and then a stent is placed. This is done by the interventional radiology. You also have a, in, a pancreatic gastrostomy. This is attempted if you have a fairly dilated duct in the upstream pancreas. Uh, at least a 3 to 4 millimeter duct should be available. 
and here under endoscopic endosonic guidance you uh, uh, you puncture the pancreatic duct place in a guide wire and then you can place in a stent uh, across uh, into the uh, into the pancreatic duct okay so dpds is a common but it is a very unrecognized or an unsought entity a keen understanding of pathophysiology is important to treat effectively associated pancreatic fluid collections make the management relatively easier endoscopic management should always be preferred for such cases in dpds and dpds associated with external pancreatic fistula often need complex endoscopic therapies or surgery thank you very much thank you for a exhaustive presentation uh,